Talking to a, a real estate agent that I'm friends with and have had the honor and privilege or of mentoring and coaching for the last seven years. And I get a call from him and we're talking and he's asking me questions about the market, which is pretty common. He and I have had these questions, these conversations many times over the last seven years. And he wanted to know what my thoughts were because he had a property that was going to go on the market. He had done a supply and demand analysis and he had discovered that the price range where the seller wanted to be was um, four months of inventory, uh, which that alone shows the market's changing, right? It's been a while since we've seen four months of inventory. However, the price range where the property needed to be in order to sell was actually seven months of inventory. And his question was, John, what would you do? And my response was, I would have a shining star conversation with them because obviously the price, uh, the price that they want is going to put them in a four month supply of inventory. All right. There's there's 20 properties for sale and five are selling every 30 days. Now the question is, are they going to be the Chinese star in, the, in, in that price range? Are they going to be one of the five that sell in the next 30 days? And the answer was clearly no, they're not going to be because they're they're priced to sell the competition versus priced to allow the competition to sell them. Where they needed to be was in that four month supply of inventory. And even in that market, they still have to be one of the top five out of 20 properties that are selling. Not easy to do. And as we're seeing this happen, what we're seeing is we're seeing the market starting to flatten out and seven months of inventory, we're seeing prices starting to drop. Even with four months of inventory, we're going to see prices starting to stop. So that led to a conversation on creating the market versus chasing the market. You don't wanna be priced so that you're chasing the market down. You wanna price it head of the market. And I wanted to come back and have a conversation with you on supply and demand. We've had this conversation before, but I think we need to have it again. So I'm gonna to go to my whiteboard and you're gonna find the right, let's see, <laughs> totally guessing here. Nope. Not the right one. So let's try that again. All right, there it is. Thank goodness. All right, so what, what I want you to do is I want you to take a sheet of paper and at the top of the sheet of paper, I want you to write A. We're gonna do math here, guys. Business is a math equation. A is the number of properties that are within a price range uh, for similar properties within a geographic area of two to three miles. Now, depending on the type of property, the geographic area might be larger. Depending on the area, the geographic area might be larger. It just depends, but start with Similar properties, in other words, if the property you're selling is a single family home, you wanna look at single family homes that are priced between 500 and 550,000. Let's go with that. And, and you guys at home, you, you don't have your, your cameras on, you can get into the MLS and start doing this exercise as I'm, as I'm speaking to you and you're gonna have ahas. You're gonna have ahas around what supply and demand actually is in your market today. So A is the number of homes that are currently for sale within a certain price range within a geographic area of two to three miles, similar property. So we're gonna look at single family homes priced between 500 and 550,000, that's A. Now, how many homes single family within that geographic area are currently on the market? That's inventory. Now B is the number of properties that sold in the last six months in the same geographic areas, similar properties, single family homes 
How many sim single family homes have sold between 500 dollars and $550,000 within that geographic area? C is B divided by six. We're taking the number of homes that sold, we're dividing it by six because we looked six months back when we did our search. And the reason I choose six months is because I need the numbers in order to do the math equation. This has nothing to do with market value. That's one of the conversations that happens about right now is an agent will tell me, well, John, this these properties aren't similar. So this really isn't a valuable exercise. And my point is, it's not about properties that are comparable to the subject property. It is simply about price and supply, demand within a certain geographic area. So how many properties sold in the last six months is B, C is B divided by six, which is gonna give us the number of homes that sold. And this exercise that I'm doing on this whiteboard in front of you, C would be four. Now, D is A divided by C. It's the number of active properties that are for sale divided by the number of homes that are selling every 30 days gives us our inventory. And in the example that I'm showing in front of you, we would have a three month supply of inventory. Now, I would want you to do the same thing from 450 to five. What are the number of active listings between 450 and 500,000? How many have sold in the last six months between 450 and 500,000? Then we would take the number of properties that sold in the last six months, we would divide it by six, that would tell us how many homes are selling every 30 days, and then we would take the number of active listings, divide that by the number of homes that are selling every 30 days, and that would give us our inventory. Now let's say, just for example, that you, this situation is kind of like the one that I was having a conversation on yesterday, and from 500 to 550, we've got four months, no, seven, yeah, four months of inventory. And between 450 and 500, there's actually seven months of inventory. So if we simply made a decision on pricing strategy, please write that down. Because in your listing presentation, when you get to pricing, it's not a conversation to determine the right price or what the home is worth. It's a conversation to determine the right strategy in order to get their goals accomplished. For example, if they told you one of my goals is to sell my home within 30 days. Awesome. Why is that important? Well, I'm moving to Tampa to start a new job in August, so I need to get a contract within 30 days. Got it. Now, what's the right strategy to get this property under contract within 30 days? Well, even though there's better supply and demand in the higher price range, we would be competing against the wrong competition. In other words, those homes that are priced between, um, you guys are changing my whiteboard, that's funny. Uh, even though, I'm gonna take the whiteboard down because that is so distracting. Okay, <laughs> even though the supply and demand between 500 and 550 is better than it is between 450 and 500, between 500 and 550, we're competing against tougher competition. We're competing against homes that are probably a little bit bigger, a little bit newer, a little bit more updated. And there's going to be sellers in that price range between 500 and 550 who absolutely need to get their home sold. They're motivated. And because they're motivated, they're gonna price their property in order to be the shining star. If there are four properties selling every 30 days, in that 500 to 550, they're going to be one of the four because they've priced themselves to beat the competition. That's another thing I want you to write down. These are all phrases and, and conversations you need to be having with your sellers in order to sell your home within 30 days and so that you can move to Tampa to start your new job. We've got to beat the competition. And there's going to be properties that are between 500 and 550 that are a little bit newer, a little bit bigger, a little bit more updated, and those are the homes that are gonna sell. In other words, we're not beating the competition, we're selling the competition. Buyers are gonna come into your property and they're gonna look at your home and then, they're gonna, and then they're gonna go out and compare it to all of the other properties that are priced in that same price range. And 
there's going to be homes that are more attractive than yours. So what you're actually doing is you're selling the competition. Now, between 450 and 500,000, even though there's seven months of inventory, okay, now the video is weird. <laughs> Great. Even though there's more competition, there's seven months of inventory, which means there's 14 homes for sale, two are selling every 30 days. We've got a better chance of being one of the two because now, rather than selling the competition, the competition is going to sell your home. Buyers are going to look at other properties priced between four fifty dollars and $500,000 and everything that they have to offer. And then they're going to look at your home and because your home in that price range is a little bit newer, a little bit more updated, a little bigger. Your home is actually going to be the shining star. We can strategically look at the competition and determine where we need to be in order to beat the competition in order to be one of the top two properties they're gonna sell in the next 30 days within this price range. Now, the strat, the solution, the formula to ensure that we're one of the two is top 25% in condition, top 25% in how your home shows, and bottom 25% in price. When you position your seller to be in the top 25% in how the property shows and the bottom 25% in price, you've positioned them to be one of the two properties that would sell within this price range. So if there's 14 properties that are for sale between 450 and 500,000, I'm gonna look at those 14 properties and they're gonna be anywhere from 450 to $500,000. Now, the bottom 25% is roughly five. It's not, a, it's not a round number. It's like four and a half. No, four times four is 16. So a little less than four. Let's go with four. All right, close. I'm going to look at the four properties that are priced the lowest. We need to be in that price range. That's where we need to be. And when we're in that price range and we're in the top 25% when it comes to how the property shows, that's a formula to sell your home. Now, if that bottom 25% means pricing the property somewhere around 460 to 465,000, then that's where you need to be. Now you're gonna have a conversation with a seller who wanted 500 plus, and you're telling them the market is telling us that the right price to get your home sold in the next 30 days so you could be in Tampa to start your new job is 465. You've got a seller who's saying, well, I wanted 510, I wanted 525, and you're telling me 465. And I'm going to share with my seller, the market determines value, not me, not you. The market is going to tell us what your home sells for. And if the right price in order to get your home sold is 465, it might feel like you're giving your home away. Script. However, if you sold your home for 465 in the next 30 days, so you could be in, a, in Tampa to start your new job in August. And the reason I keep going back to that is because logic makes us think and emotion makes us act. And I'm going to the emotion of this conversation because emotion is what's going to cause them to make the right decision. In, order, in other words, emotion is going to be what's going to cause them to, to make the right choices, to act the right way. Now, if your home sold for 465 and six months from now, you realize that if you sold it six months from now, you would actually sell it for 450. And six months ago, you sold it for 465. And you're not in the home anymore. You've moved. You're in your new home. You're working your job in Tampa. Did you give your home away? Well, the answer is clearly no. It's not. Now, you sold your home for roughly $60,000, $70,000 less than you wanted to. But the market said all along that the right price was four sixty-five. dollars Did you sell your home for less than it was worth? No, you didn't. You sold it for less than what you wanted to. However, you sold it for what it was worth. 
Now, perspective becomes part of this conversation. In other words, part of my job is to make the homeowner feel better about the decision that they're making. So I would ask, Annie, when did you buy your home? And she's going to share with me, well, 2012. And I'm going to and I'm going to share with her, well, that's awesome. You've got a lot of equity in your home over the last 11 years. Matter of fact, if the market appreciated at an average of 10% a year over 10 years, your value doubled. So this property that you're selling today for 465,000, you bought for 250 10 years ago. Round it off, okay? And did you lose money? No, I didn't. I actually made a lot of money. Now, during the time, during that time, you lived in the home. Yes, I did. You enjoyed the benefits. Yes, I did. You were not renting your home. No, I wasn't. If you were renting your home and you were paying $3,000 a month to rent it over a 10-year period, that's $360,000 that you would have paid to rent. Did you spend $360,000 to rent your home? No, I didn't. And you're selling it with a profit of approximately $200,000. Yep. If you had a stock that you purchased 10 years ago and it was worth double today what you purchased it for, would you consider that a good investment? Yes, I would. If I told you you should buy stock today in XYZ company and it's going to grow by an average of 10% every year for the next 10 years, would you buy it 100%? I would take every dime I had and I would put it into that stock. Absolutely. And that's what you did when you bought this home 10 years ago. Now I'm changing the way they look at things. So the things they're looking at changing and perspective is so important in this conversation. Remember that perspective is the only thing that can dramatically change the outcome of an event without changing any of the facts. And you need to master this conversation in order to help people make the right decision. Now, how would I use this if I have somebody on the market right now and I realize, oh my gosh, they're in the wrong market. We're fishing with our bait out of the water. We need to get that bait down in the water where the fish are. I would simply let the data be the bad guy. And I would let the data do the heavy lifting. And I would simply share with Corey, here's the data, Corey. Your home is at 510. Here's what the market is telling us about properties that are priced between 500 and 550,000. Now, here's what the market's telling us about properties that are between 450 and 500. Now, just out of curiosity, Corey, where does your heart stop? So this is a heart stop conversation. All of these are scripts. All of these scripts live inside um, the books that I've written, um, you can send me a text message. I'll send you a copy of the updated version of Rainmaker Playbook, which has eventually will have every script in it, uh, finally. <laughs> and where does your heart stop? She's going to say, what do you mean? Well, what price, at what price would you decide not to sell your home? If you got an offer today for $495,000, what would you do? More than likely, they're going to say, take it, right? <laughs> and at $510,000, is the buyer that's going to give you four ninety five dollars going to see your home? Probably not, which means you don't even have a chance to get that offer. Now, what if the offer was four eighty? dollars What would you do then? Well, I'd still sell it, but I'd be really unhappy. Okay, I get it. What if it was 475? Nope, that's it. That's where my heart stops. I'm not selling my home. All right, so if the market says no to the price you want, what's plan B? You're going to get a couple different answers. Two I'll give you right now. One would be I'll rent it. I'll just, I'm moving to Tampa. I've got this job, so I'll rent it. Cool. Renting your home might be the right thing to do. However, before you do that, what's your greatest fear? And they're going to come up with some version of, I'm going to get somebody who's not paying my rent. I'm going to have to evict them. 
And my response to that would be, yeah, absolutely. Now, let's just say, for example, you had somebody on your property that's renting and they, they're they not making their payments and it takes you four or five months to evict them. Your rent is $3,000 a month. And over a five month period, you've lost $15,000 and you get it back with $20,000 in damage. You've lost $35,000. Are you okay with that? When they say no, your response is, so renting is not plan B, so now what's plan B? Just be quiet. They're in pain. They're uncomfortable. That's okay. Let them think about that because they control the price, not you. Now, if they're not moving to Tampa, they're not starting a new job, and let's say they're they're not super motivated to get their home sold. They want to sell, but they don't have to. Then the next thing I'm going to say, if they say, well, I just won't sell, my answer is going to be, yeah, that might be the right decision. However, if a year from now, your home is worth even less, how would you feel about that? What if you found out that your home would not be worth more than it is today for another eight years? So a decision not to sell doesn't mean that you can put the property back on the market in a year or two years from now or three years from now. It's going to be eight years before you can get the same price you could, could, could get today. How would you feel about that? Now, you might hear, why are you saying eight years? And I'm going to pull out the graph of the market back in between 2006 and 2012. And I'm going to show them, not tell them. This is what happened last time the market shifted. We saw inventory start to go up. That's what's happening right now. In 2006, fewer sales, more listings, fewer showings, fewer leads. And eventually what happened is prices started to drop. It took about a year and a half for that to happen. However, between 2008 and 2012, they dropped drastically. And then it was 2016 before prices were back where they were in 2008. In other words, eight years. And what if this time is like that time? I'm going to stop again and I'm going to let them answer that question. All right. I know you've got some questions. Take yourself off mute. Talk to me.